And uh, well, thank you very much for uh, coming to uh, the uh, last seminar of the summer. And um, the talk of the, uh, this seminar is to talk about a cutaneous epithelioid uh, mesenchymal tumor that, um, that can actually resemble something uh, different uh, other than uh, the uh, other than the mesenchymal neoplasm, you know, because they look very uh, they look very epi epithelioid. So let's just see here how we can afford. So no conflicts of interest. So the what is what is what are what are what what, what, what do you mean by the term uh, epithelioid? Well, they are predominantly or extensively comprise these tumors uh, by uh, rounded or polygonal cells resembling epithelial cells. I mean, that is a differential, but they're not really of epithelial lineage. They are epithelioid, right? In res resembling a tumor of epithelial lineage, but the reality they are of mesenchymal lineage uh, uh, for the most part, although there are a heterogeneous group of, of, of divergent uh, lineages, but. For, for this lecture, we're going to obviously focus uh, on the mesenchymal lineage uh, as, the talk of, as the title of my talk. So uh, the incidence is quite low for this uh, neoplasm. So the, um, these tumors are very challenging to uh, diagnose. And the anatomic location is an important factor that you take into account for your differential diagnosis. Uh, for example, uh, a malignant epithelioid uh, on the head and neck, you know, angios, uh, from the mesenchymal uh, group, obviously an epithelial angiosarcoma will be very high on your list. Or if you have a history of uh, radiation uh, in the field, uh, then a, a radiation uh, uh, induced uh, sarcoma with epithelial features that will be very, very high on your list. And, and you can think about these uh, neoplasms uh, in terms of architectural patterns. And we're not going to go through uh, all of this because there's not much, uh, there's not enough time. But uh, for example, lobulated architecture, you, you know, many, uh, it's common for epithelial hemangiomas or myepitheliomas or epithelial MPNSTs uh, to have uh, this architecture. Or um, nested architecture, you're thinking about uh, clear cell sarcoma, cellular neurothechioma. Sometimes you have trabecular or cord like architecture that myopithelomas or sclerosing picomas can do that. Uh, so kind of different patterns uh, that uh, makes you actually put uh, different boxes uh, of differential diagnosis or seed-like architecture, there are a lot of different things, uh, granular cells, or tumors with predominantly uh, inflammatory cells, you're thinking about mixo-inflammatory fibroblastic sarcoma uh, and, and things like that. We're not gonna have time to go in every single one of them, uh, but, um, uh, we're going to talk by, uh, by, by a few of them. So you don't need a lot of immunohistochemical stains uh, in uh, cutaneous mesenchymal pathology actually to make accurate diagnosis. Uh, you don't need a, a gazillion of stains, but uh, you need some stains uh, to actually exclude uh, different other lineages. Of course, epithelial markers uh, play an important role. Uh, I use CKM and F116 covers a little bit more um, keratins than the CKA1A3. Uh, EMA, of course, mal more specific melanocytic markers, uh, melanA, HMB45. Vascular markers, you always use two because sometimes they can lose one or the other. Uh, and CB31 and ERG is the ones I use. Of course, S100, SOX10 uh, for rectodermal, melanocytic, etc. And then other, these, these stains are useful, ALK, SMA, CD34, and IA1. I, I would say that this is your immunoxochemical uh, package that you may use. You don't use all of them, uh, but with these stains, I think you can actually uh, make uh, the great majority of the diagnosis of uh, cutaneous epithelioid uh, tumors. So we're going to start with epithelioid myofibroblastic and my uh, fibrohistiocytic tumors that we uh, talked a lot in our previous uh, my previous seminar. Uh, and the first entity I'm going to talk is uh, the epithelioid fibrous histiocytoma. And uh, this is now a separate entity, but in the old days before we actually uh, discover uh, its molecular pathogenesis, the definition was it, has, it was a variant of fibrous histiocytoma would have at least 50% of lesional cells uh, having epithelial uh, morphology. Uh, but 
you know, that definition is not very scientific. Uh, what does it mean at 50%? If it's 45, it's not. If it's 55, it is. It's always, it was not very satisfactory. And it, it, it wasn't uh, based on objective scientific uh, data. It was just a morphological objection with a, a, with a pretty high interobservable variability. But the recent data I'm going to uh, tell you is that uh, showing a distinct immunohistochemical and genetic profile uh, that supports that is actually a uh, distinct uh, neoplasm. And, and this is how it looks microscopically. It's usually uh, has this uh, epidermal colorette. Uh, it's not like your usual benign fibrous cytoma, dermatofibroma, who actually goes and uh, entraps a collagen bundle up the periphery. It has this bland uh, epithelioid cells who have this ab uh, abandoned pale eosinophilic cytoplasm with vesicular nuclei and small nucleoli with no pleomorphism, no uh, atypical mitosis, necrosis, uh, et cetera. Sometimes you see this perivascular accentuation and sometimes you see kind of interspersed uh, multinuclear uh, giant cells uh, and the mitotic activity is usually uh, uh, low. And it has this kind of fibrohistiocytic uh, look. One um, pitfall is, uh, because your differential is with other uh, tumors, including a sclerosing uh, perineurioma, is that uh, epithelial fabric cytoma, a potential diagnostic pitfall uh, before we discover more specific uh, immunostochemical stains, uh, was that it is, can be diffusely focal or multifocal positivity for, for EMA, and it's something that you should be uh, aware of. However, now we know that uh, the great majority of epithelial fibrocytoma, the pathogenesis is through ALK uh, rearrangements, uh, and that translates to over uh, to protein expression. So, uh, and here of, of 80%, 88% on the seminal paper about this, and every other uh, fibrohistiocytic tumor that it was potentially within the differential of epithelial fibrous histiotoma was actually negative for ALK, which is uh, a very uh, sensitive stain. And of course, depending on the clone that you use, uh, ALK, I don't use ALK1, which is the, the clone that is most commonly available in different labs that the hematopathologists use. I would say that the five, uh, I use D5F3 uh, or the 5A4 are more sensitive uh, clones and this is what I recommend for you to use. Uh, and it shows diffuse positivity for ALK. It works very well in the great majority of cases. And actually depending on the partner, the same thing that you see in inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors or anaplastic lymphoma, you can see different patterns of uh, immunostochemical staining. The ALK, the ALK fees, uh, and that correlates with ALK rearrangement, and that the fees you see here that uh, uh, the, it, uh, the two probes are far away from uh, each other. So this is uh, it's a it's a, a balanced translocation. Where here you see that actually one color is gone. Uh, that actually means that this uh, indicative of an unbalanced uh, translocation. The centromeric probe was, was lost. So that correlates. So there is a true rearrangement that correlates with um, uh, ALK protein uh, overexpression. And epithelial fibrous cytoma can look classic and uh, you don't need necessarily uh, to do even immunohistochemical stains, uh, but some of them that look kind of weird. Uh, they have kind of different patterns. Uh, so you, you may strike, you may not you know, uh, with the first uh, with the first glance, think about epithelial fibrocytoma. For example, that was a, a bizarre case of uh, epithelial fibrocytoma resembling the benign tumor that you see in young uh, people in the epiphysis, uh, chondroblastoma, chondroblastoma like with these kind of uh, uh, Granchi class, uh, classifications. Uh, and here was it is a case of uh, of a chondroblastoma. You will have this. Uh, plant uh, plump cells that uh, with abandoning eosinophilic cytoplasm and had this kind of uh, pericellular uh, classification here kind of resembling uh, chondroblastoma and of course it was diffusely positive for for ALK. Uh, so and occasionally you can see reactive uh, osteoclastic um, osteoclast like giant cells here but this is a weird pattern you know this kind of pericellular classification that you should be aware of and think about uh, uh, an epithelial fibrous uh, histiocytoma. Of course, when uh, we actually um, describe a tumor with morphological terms, uh, then uh, and 
then the more that we uh, uh, the more that we um, uh, study these tumors, we actually see that the morphologic spectrum is actually pretty wide. Uh, so uh, that's what happens. And then the name stacks and it doesn't reflect the morphologic heterogeneity or variety of this tumor. So epithelial fibrosis cytomas can be spindle, uh, spindle pedomino or completely spindle. So it's something that you should think when you see something that has this fibrohistiocytic look, but they are all ALK positive, uh, ALK rearranged and ALK diffusely positive. Uh, and this is a nice series this month of the spindle cell virus of epithelial cell histiatoma, a uh, linguistic ox oxymoron. But uh, that is, uh, again, what happens when we describe a tumor and then uh, with morphologic terms, and then we see that it has, it has actually a much broader morphologic uh, variety. Now, epithelial fibrous cytoma, as I, as I told you, has all rearrangements. Some people want to see, well, what is the uh, uh, variety of partners? Because many ALK rearranged neoplasms have a, a, a different, uh, have different partners, uh, different a variety of partners. Uh, and this is like two nice studies for uh, that they did next generation sequencing, and they discovered that the most uh, common partner is the SQSTM1 and there are and BCL, and then there were other different uh, partners. And uh, there are a lot of a lot of very different partners that have been described in epithelial fibrous histoma, but the most common are the uh, VCL and SQSTM1. These are the most common partners, but there are again uh, a lot of different partners doesn't really matter. They're all staying for AUG and they're also AUG rearrangement by fish. So nosologically now we know it is a distinct um, tumor type. It's not a subtype of epithelial of a fibrous histoma of dermatofibroma who has uh, different pathogenesis, has PRKC uh, mutations. Um, and then you can use ALK as a diagnostically useful uh, marker for epithelial fibrous histoma. And it's kind of interesting that biologically this illustrates further the remarkable plasticity of the ALK gene as an oncogenic driver and highlighting its diverse role uh, in uh, uh, giving different entities with a similar genetic, uh, similar genetic pathogenesis. And so we wrote a review a couple of years, uh, a few years ago, it's still very up to date. It doesn't have the most common partners, et cetera, but it has almost everything. So if you're interested, you can actually uh, read it and it's everything you need to know. Now, another tumor of which uh, belongs in the fibroblastic category is the so-called mixo-inflammatory fibroblastic sarcoma or MIPS, which is uh, a low-grade uh, fibroblastic uh, sarcoma which is characterized by a superficial mass and the soft tissues that are uh, located above the fascia and many times involving the dermis and the subcutis. There is something that actually the dermatopathologists will see and, and happens in uh, young and middle-aged adults with uh, no sex uh, predilection. And it usually um, happens in distal extremities, you know, fingers, hands, and feet, but actually may happen uh, in the uh, outside. Now we know the extremities has been described in head and neck region, and the scalp, uh, trunk, buttocks uh, in, different, in different locations. Uh, and it's slow growing uh, and recurrence, it's a low grade thing. So recurrences are common, but metastases are rare. Uh, I'm just going to stop here again. If you can't hear me or don't hear me very well, just send me a message in the chat because I haven't received the message, so I'm not quite sure if you hear me. The, this is a, a picture to show and actually can be quite difficult in superficial biopsies if, that derma, if it goes to dermatologists and, and they don't know if actually uh, it's a big tumor underneath and they show it's kind of a small superficial tumor, but you see these mixohyaline and collagenous uh, zones kind of have this multinodular appearance. It has this kind of bizarre, a typical spindle to epithelial tumor, which kind of resemble uh, Ritz uh, Stenberg uh, cells so with this prominent nucleoli and irregular nuclear contours. And it characteristically has this uh, prominent inflammatory cell uh, infiltrate. So that is um, a characteristic you should think about mixed inflammatory fibroblastic sarcoma, which can involve uh, the dermis. And what is, and this is another tumor shows this kind of uh, tumor that involves the entire dermis and the subcutis and has areas kind of look more solid and spindle uh, with uh, mixoid areas and then other areas that they look more, the cells look more epithelioid with abundant eosinophilic cyanoplasm. And you, you can have areas that they have a, um, 
uh, they have this kind of uh, area that kind of uh, transition between spindle cells and epithelial, epithelial cells. So this is a case of <coughs> a mixo-inflammatory fibroblastic uh, sarcoma. Case we, we, it's another tumor can show epithelioid features. Now, I don't use immunohistochemical stains. I don't think they're very useful. Uh, to be quite frank, it's, it's a really uh, a morphologic diagnosis, but there are some recent uh, data on this. And one is this, this um, stain uh, BCL1, which is basically a cell cycle regulatory protein that encode, encodes for the human CCND1 uh, protein. Uh, and that cancer is essential for the transition from G1 to S phase. So there are a lot of different tumors that they show BCL1 overexpression, uh, epithelial malignancies, carcinomas, uh, Mandosol lymphomas, neuroblastoma, and a few types of sarcomas. However, at least according to the data so far, superficial tumors, sarcomas that there are within the differential of mixed inflammatory fibroblastic sarcoma, uh, they don't actually show BCL1 uh, positivity so far. I don't know if this is going to stand the test of time. So this paper uh, last year actually showed that the great majority of um, mixed inflammatory fibroblastic sarcoma show positivity for BCL1 could put could be a potential useful marker for making the diagnosis of this neoplasm. There are actually were positive for CD10, 13A, uh, and D240. CD10, I don't use it. People use it for AFX. It's not specific at all. And, and especially if you get a superficial biopsy, which uh, the mixture inflammatory fibroblast sarcoma can resemble uh, the uh, uh, can resemble an AFX, that kind of be a kind of misleading. Now, uh, but if you combine that with factor 13A, which usually AFX are negative and uh, due to 40, they're not, nothing of that specific, but if you have uh, the right clinical pathologic context, uh, these stains may uh, actually be of some help to make uh, an accurate diagnosis. And this is some uh, stain of the pseudolipoblast that you, you characteristically see in mixture inflammatory fibroblast sarcoma for BCL1 positivity and factor 13A. Uh, again, I don't use these stains personally, but uh, and uh, I don't know if they're going to stand the, uh, the test of time, but um, the, uh, they have some potential, at, at least according to this uh, paper in the right clinical pathologic context, to be uh, useful. What do we know about the pathogenesis? We kind of debate because the same um, because people believe they belong the spectrum of other two other entities, the pleomorphic hyalinizing and jectatic tumor and uh, the uh, hemosiderotic lipomatous tumor, but uh, a subset of them, but it's a small minority, uh, shows unbalanced translocation with uh, TGFBR3 OGA, which is formerly for the, uh, formerly known the MGEA5 gene, which uh, this translocation, on, uh, it doesn't transcribe a functional protein, but leads to upregulation of NPM, uh, NPM3 and FGF8, which believes they actually play a role in the pathogenesis of these neoplasms. And uh, you see characteristically in a subset of them supernumerary chromosomes with amplified chromosome uh, region chromosome three. So if you do a SNP array, you see this amplification on this area, which leads to the overexpression of BGL3, and that believes a place in the pathogenesis. Now, a subset of them that they don't have <coughs> TGFBR3 fusions, they have BRAF translocations. Uh, they then involve different partners, or they can have BRAF amplification. And now there is commercially available uh, BRAF uh, probe uh, that you can use uh, uh, to make that diagnosis. <coughs> but again, that is in a, in a subset of, of cells. Moving on to epithelial vascular tumors. One tumor that uh, raises the difference of epithelial tumors in the skin is obviously glomus tumors, which is uh, composed of these modified smooth muscle cells uh, of a normal glomus body and frequently happens in the adrenal extremities. And as classically, you know, there can be solitary and, and painful, uh, but there are familial syndromes, for example, of multiple familial glomus tumor uh, syndrome that they can show an autosomal dominant uh, pattern. And this is a classic case of uh, glomus tumor has this perivascular proliferation of this homogeneous round to ovoid nuclei with multicellular layers. And the characteristically, they show uh, diffuse positivity for SMA, and they actually show nice diffuse positivity for collagen 4, 
high landing the basement membrane. So that is a classic glomus tumor. But of course, glomus tumors can be very epithelioid, raising problems with other epithelioid uh, tumors uh, in, in, the, in, in the differential. And of course, if they're benign, it's fine. But of course, we have malignant glomus tumors. And there's an example here of a large infiltrating tumor with many mitosis, uh, TPI, and spindle areas. And here you can see the cytologic features have this moderate nuclear TPI with multiple mitotic figures, or here kind of infiltrating tumor with the cytologic uh, TPI. And of course, the first criteria when, when you call glomus tumor, glomus tumor of uncertain malignant potential, glomus, uh, malignant glomus tumor, there were uh, many, many years ago, well, 20 years ago from my mentor, Sarah Wise, but the recent study, because this criteria take into account the size, take into account uh, uh, mitotic figures uh, in 50 high power fields, et cetera, people looked at this and actually in, in, in this a recent paper in human pathology, this criteria that traditionally we use for, to assess malignancy for glomus tumor do have applicability in, in, in cutaneous glomus tumors. So the answer is they don't. Even uh, the only tumor on necrosis was actually found to be statistically significant in a univariate analysis. And when they went to multivariate analysis, none actually had, uh, could actually predict biologic uh, behavior. Uh, so the fact of the matter is, and the fact is because it's very difficult to assess uh, this criteria for cutaneous tumors because they, they have this threshold of two centimeters and uh, cutaneous tumors are always less than two centimeters. Uh, and they're small, you don't have enough tissue to tumor to assess 50 high power fields. And the fact of the matter is that they behave very, very indolent, even the, 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 the malignant ones, as long as you excise them with clear margins. So they don't have much applicability, so I don't sweat that much, to be honest, but I tell, I tell them that they need to, to be, to, to be re-excised if they have a typical features or any way fulfill the criteria for malignant, but usually they, they know, most, most of the times they're not going to uh, behave aggressively. In terms of the molecular pathogenesis of, uh, of uh, glomus tumor, the half of them we show, they show NOTS gene fusions. And the most common is NOTS2 uh, MRI, MIR143 is the most common and a smaller subset has uh, BRAF uh, V600E mutations. Uh, there's, a, there's a new paper uh, last year, it, it kind of reappraised the molecular pathogenesis of a glomus tumor. 50% uh, the show NOTS fusions, as we know, and NOTS2 is the most common partner, uh, the most common uh, gene. Uh, the most common partner is the MIR143. Now, up, among these NOTS fusion positive tumors, which is 50%, two, of the, two thirds are benign and one third are malignant. So sometimes malignant glomus tumor is a really, really difficult diagnosis. So NGS to assess or FISH to assess for NOTS uh, rearrangements can be actually very helpful uh, to uh, make the diagnosis. And uh, most global uh, tumor that they didn't have rearrangements uh, of the other half, they were actually, uh, they were actually uh, benign. And the most um, malignant NOTS positive tumors there were in the viscera. Now, it's interesting that the glomus tumor that we, as a dermatopathologist, we get uh, in the fingers, uh, uh, the subungal lesions, they didn't, they all, they all half of them, um, half of the fusion negatives were located in the figures, so they're not driven by notch fusions, and this, that suggests they may have an unrelated uh, pathogenesis. There is some small overlap. Uh, some uh, glomus tumors may have PDGFRB mutations, or some myofibromas or microcytomas, angiomas, they may have a notch rearrangement, but that overlap is very small. Uh, so for the most part, the entities of the perivascular uh, myotumors, they are distinct, genetically distinct. So you have the knots to rearrange that the, 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 the glomus tumors belong. And then you have uh, the uh, PTGRFR beam mutant, what you see in angiolia myomas and myopericytomas. Epithelial hemangioma is uh, a, a tumor on the head and most commonly present on the head and neck, often periauricular. Uh, and it can happen most commonly middle age adults. Uh, one, Thing you should know uh, it can rarely happen intravascular. That should not be uh, discouraged of making a benign diagnosis. The thing, the same thing happens with pyogenic granulomas, and also can be multifocal uh, and resemble metastatic, but on the same region. Uh, that can happen uh, in the bone in about 25% of the cases. Uh, that, that's that is still compatible compatible with an indolent uh, biologic behavior. Uh, 
going to show a few pictures, but it generally they are uh, circumscribed and, and, and uh, dermal or subcutaneous. And uh, usually they surround a large vessel, but not all the time. And characteristically, they have an inflammatory infiltrate. And then have this characteristic epithelioid cells will hobnail with voluminous eosinophilic cytoplasm. And now the morphologic subtypes are um, of the conventional subtype the angiolipoid hyperplasia with the eosinophilia subtype and the cellular subtype. These are the three uh, subtypes of uh, epithelial hemangiomas, and this is a classic uh, that can be multi, can have multifocal uh, regionally, that's fine. Uh, and this is a classic uh, case that I had of epithelial hemangioma, very well circumscribed around a big vessel here. Uh, and if you go high power, you have this inflammatory infiltrate, uh, intermingling eosinophils in the angiolipoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia subtype. And then you have these epithelioid gland uh, cells with top nail um, cytologic features and voluminous eosinophilic uh, cytoplasm. Uh, this was an intravascular, which can be uh, more cellular and has uh, be less obvious that it's actually vascular uh, tumor because it can be... Um, uh, the uh, vascular channels are kind of compressed, but again, epithelioid cells with voluminous eosinophilic uh, cytoplasm and interspersed inflammatory components. Of course, uh, it's a uh, hemangioma is going to be positive for vascular markers, uh, 31, 34 ERG, uh, and also can be positive for D to 40, but you have to be aware that epithelial vascular tumors, and, the, the, and especially the more epithelioid they get, they may actually be positive for EMA and keratins for focal, multifocal, or, or even a diffuse fashion. And that is a, a common pitfall. And I've seen epithelial angiosarcoma has been misdiagnosed as uh, adenocarcinomas because they were keratin positive and things like that. So you, you, you have to be aware of that possibility. Now we kind of start knowing the pathogenesis of these tumors. And we know that a subset of them have phosphate rearrangements. Um, especially the ZFP36 that happen in the penile region have atypical features. Something that you should be aware of, that epithelial hemangiomas can have atypical features, uh, even necrosis or atypical mitosis. Uh, and uh, many times they happen in the penile region. And uh, you may be tempted to diagnose this as, as epithelial angiosarcoma, uh, but that will be dreadful to do that because you're going to get a penectomy the next day, the next week. Uh, so you have to be aware that every time you see an atypical epithelial vascular tumor, especially in the penile region and, and elsewhere, think about an atypical epithelial hemangioma. And here was a, case, a study about phosphor rearrangements in epithelial hemangioma. You see here the cutaneous, again, it was in the penile region, so phosphor rearrangement. Now there is a, a, an, immuno, an immunostain, uh, FOSB. Uh, which actually work pretty well. Uh, it's not like super specific, but it worked in the appropriate morphologic context. And this was a nice paper about phosphine reactivity in epithelial hemangioma. Uh, this is a cavernous type, but it's actually epithelial hemangioma uh, with nice nuclear clear positivity here. And of course, uh, epithelial hemangiomas, like uh, any hemangioma can be eruptive, so it can have multiple. Uh, and uh, here have uh, eruptive epithelial hemangiomas that all of them showed positivity for uh, false P and a few cases here, well circumscribed epithelioid uh, cells with voluminous eosinophilic cytoplasm and this diffused nuclear positivity with uh, non-specific cytoplasmic positivity, but you're looking about nuclear positivity here for false P uh, supporting the diagnosis of epithelial hemangioma. So the genetic alterations of epithelial hemangiomas, 20% uh, of the cellular subtype, so WWTR1 and ZP36 FOSB. And then um, you have FOS rearrangements that FOS and FOSB, they belong to the same family with different kinds of partners. And in terms of sensitivity of the immunostochemical marker, FOSB is positive in 75% uh, of conventional subtype, approximately all of them in angiolipoid hyperplasia and 10% of the cellular uh, subtype. Now, more recent data show that not all of them show FOS or rearrangements or FOSB. Uh, some of them show as a subset of epithelial hemangioma, especially the ones that they are have a predilection for skin and head and neck location. They show uh, GATA6 and FOX01 fusions. Uh, they should be aware. So these presumably uh, they're going to be negative for the FOSB immunostochemical stain. So really, they look really like epithelial hemangiomas and kind of expands the molecular pathogenesis of these neoplasms. Cutaneous epithelial angiomatoid nodule, uh, it can be multiple, eruptive, or, or, uh, uni or, or solitary, uh, kind of resembles epithelial hemangioma, 
uh, it can have actually conspicuous mitotic activity, but the mitotes are not, uh, they are not uh, atypical. And here you see this uh, well circumscribed nodule in the dermis, intratumoral hemorrhage is actually a very uh, common finding and a clue to the diagnosis. And you have these uh, seeds of epithelioid endothelial cells with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and enlarged nuclei. And here, many times characteristically, you have this uh, epidermal colorette. And uh, of course, these tumors can be multifocal and eruptive, uh, as many epithelioid of, as epithelial hemangiomas and other tumors, and that's not a problem. And people, this is a big study from Boston when they check about FOSB. Uh, and you see here that half of them showed uh, positivity for FOSB. Uh, actually, the epithelioid angiomatoid nodule, none of them showed a FOSB positivity, suggesting that it's a distinct entity or it has a different kind of uh, molecular, uh, molecular path pathogenesis. Epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. Uh, now we know uh, it is uh, in the current WHO, it's actually a sarcoma, a low grade but fully malignant uh, vascular uh, tumor uh, that shows endothelial differentiation, primitive endothelial differentiation. You're not going to see uh, well formed vascular structures in epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. And it's important to diagnose because it causes less aggressive, it's aggressive, but it's less aggressive than epithelial angiosarcoma. It has a risk of metastasis 20, 30%. And we're, we're going to talk about a little bit about uh, new findings in terms of stratification of these patients and death in approximately 50%. However, the cutaneous epithelial hemangioma, hemangioendotheliomas, they behave much better than the uh, uh, visceral epithelial hemangioma. And it can, it can be seen everywhere, but most commonly it includes the soft tissue, bone, uh, lung, liver, and uh, skin. And um, it has clinically a non-descriptive uh, appearance, uh, a nodule doesn't resemble a vascular tumor uh, uh, clinically. And as I said, the cutaneous epithelial hemangioma has a better prognosis than the deep one. Now it can affect all pac patients of all ages, but it's rare to see that in children. Uh, and the other thing is, if you get multiple cutaneous nodules, that they're all multiple epithelial hemangiomas, think about uh, metastas, meta, 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 metastasizing uh, deep soft tissue or osseous epithelial hemangiomas. You know, epithelial hemangiomas in a deep, that big vessel that kind of throws uh, emboli uh, in the skin. Uh, and this can, can be actually uh, seen. And this is a classic case of uh, a low grade. Uh, Epithelial hemangioendothelioma has these epithelioid cells in a mixer halonine background with these kind of primitive blisters, pr primitive uh, uh, vascular lumini, the so-called uh, cytoplasm blisters who may have uh, red blood cells, they may not. And, and so kind of, kind of bland, uh, not high grade uh, morphology, but there are epithelial hemangioendothelioma that they have high grade cytologic features uh, kind of resemble epithelial angiosarcomas, and these are more difficult to diagnose and important to differentiate them from epithelial uh, angiosarcoma. This is the uh, again one case of epithelial hemangioendothelioma. This vasculocentric pattern is helpful, but it doesn't be, is not seen very commonly in the skin. You see that much more commonly in other organs. And again, epithelial cells arranged in cords and seeds in a mix of halonine background and have this primitive uh, vaso primitive uh, vascular uh, differentiation. You're not going to see good vasoformative areas in epithelial hemangioendothelioma. Uh, the, uh, and here, blister cells with uh, intracytoplasmic uh, red blood cells. Now, the caveat here, again, it's a, it's a vascular tumor. So epithelial vascular tumors, they can be positive for uh, CD31, for an ERK, for vascular markers, but they can be positive one quarter of the cases for uh, keratins. So this is a, a pitfall, and again, uh, because you just do keratin, you it has this seeds and cords like Indian filing, you may confuse that for a metastatic breast, uh, lobular breast cancer or things like that. Uh, so you always think about, if you have a keratin epithelial tumor, think about is, is this epithelial or it could be a different lineage but has epithelioid um, cytologic features and think about vascular. Uh, tumors. Now, the molecular pathogenesis of this tumor, we know that they have a recurrent translocation involving WWTR1 and CAMTA1 in a great majority, and then a subset of them uh, show YAP1 uh, TFP3 rearrangement. And now there is a very good immunostochemical stain, CAMTA1, uh, which is helpful in diagnosing epithelial hemangioma in the appropriate clinical morphology context. You see here a big study from Boston, 86% um, they were positive 
and um, the ones that were negative, they were some of them were decal specimen, and one epithelial angiosarcoma was positive. The authors, in retrospect, think that that was a misdiagnosis and was probably a, a malignant uh, uh, an epithelial hematoid glioma with uh, high-grade uh, cytologic uh, features. And many other tumors in the differential vascular tumors and other, they were all negative and it has this crisp uh, nuclear positivity. Uh, and you see here that the neoplastic cells are nicely positive and the background fibroblast and reactive cells are negative. And this is an epithelial hematoid glioma in the lung that it was uh, positive here. You see the, how, how nicely the uh, cells are staining uh, positive. And then again, this is an epithelial hematoid glioma in the liver. This is the background liver cells. And you see that neoplastic cells are intermingled and po positive in between the liver cells. Uh, this uh, a different study from Japan show that many, many other tumors, uh, mesenchymal tumors were negative. A majority of epithelial hematoid gliomas were positive for cam one And then from carcinomas, it was just one case of breast cancer gnoma, 10% of cells, uh, nothing that it makes you actually confuse you and make the wrong diagnosis. So pretty sensitive and specific stain. But of course, we learn more and then we know that there's a variety, a variant of epithelial hemangium glioma that doesn't show CAMTA1 partner. You show WWTR1 rearrangements, uh, but with different partners. Uh, and that have, a, for, for now, they have a propensity for cardiac involvement. I don't know if they're going to stand the test of time. There are only like six, seven cases out there. Uh, but presumably, if you do come tier one, it's going to be negative. <clears throat> so that kind of reduces a little bit uh, the specificity of this antibody. A few words of the, the subset of um, uh, hemangium, epithelial hemangium glioma are uh, have YAP1 TFE3 uh, rearrangement. Um, and these look different. They have, they have vasoformative areas which we never see in your uh, classic epithelial hemangioma glioma with this voluminous eosinophilic cytoplasm. And of course, they're diffusely positive for TFP3. Now for TFP3, you have to be careful because it's not non-specific and you may get, may get a little bit of uh, weak positivity. You wanna, for, to, be an, uh, to be a reliable surrogate for underlying TFP3 rearrangement, you really wanna see diffuse, strong uh, positivity uh, to your um, you actually be a surrogate that they may actually be a true TFP3 rearrangement. Uh, and again, a different case here, uh, you see here diffusely positive for TFP3 and, and dead negative for CAMTA1 and positive for CD31. Now I told you that uh, the other, the gene that is translocated is in YAP1. And uh, YAP1, you actually started, there are other tumors that show YAP1 rearrangement, for example, poro tumors, poromas and porocarcinomas, and there is, uh, um, medulloblastomas and things like that. So there is a, 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 an immunostochemical stain that stains the uh, C-terminus. And the C-terminus is actually lost uh, when you have a YAP1 a rearrangement. Uh, and so you can do the stain if you see loss, that is indicative that you have a YAP1 uh, rearrangement. And people, uh, they looked at this, so you had 13 cases of uh, epithelial hematoid glioma with TFE3-1 and 10 cases were lost, three were retained. There was one case of the ordinary that it was lost. And then YAP1 rearrangements have been seen in rediform and composite hemangium gliomas, and they were lost in these cases, and they were uh, retained in uh, pseudomyogenic hemangium glioma and epithelial hemangioma and epithelial angiosarcoma. So it's not perfect, but it has a decent uh, sensitivity and specificity that you can combine that with morphology and TFE3 immuno. So it can be actually helpful. It actually suggests that you're dealing with a YAP1 uh, TFE3 uh, neoplasm. And here, uh, a couple of cases of YAP1 TFE3 with uh, vasoformative areas and voluminous eosinophilic cytoplasm that you see here have loss of the C terminus of YAP1 with retention, the background uh, fibroblastic cells and endothelial cells. And this is another case of YAP1 TFE3 uh, fusion that show uh, the same loss uh, suggesting a YAP1 rearrangement. But of course, things are not are not uh, straightforward. Uh, you there is the paper here for epithelial hemangioma glioma that show both uh, CAMTA1 and TFE3 translocation uh, with uh, overexpression of the subsequent immunostochemical stains, uh, and it's kind of interesting that they are rare, uh, but uh, it can be more complicated and it's not as 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 simple. 
<clears throat> in terms of prognostication, uh, this is a nice paper from uh, MSK uh, that they found that actually uh, the uh, things that can <clears throat> predict how this uh, they're going to react <clears throat> clinically are uh, multifocality, uh, plural involvement, uh, lymph node, and distal metastasis. They have people who have this. Uh, they have a significant worse uh, outcome and behave really aggressively, really like a high-grade sarcoma with a five-year survival of uh, 20 to 30 percent, uh, where if they don't have these factors like plural involvement, multifocality, lymph node, et cetera, they actually behave in much uh, uh, better, <clears throat> much better, uh, much better than the, uh, the ones that had these factors. And then this is a very recent study from Japan that they didn't actually corroborate the results of the previous one, but these may actually relate with the design of the study. Uh, and it seems that uh, the prognostic model that they suggested, we're gonna talk about this. So they had size and then they had a typical uh, histologic features and they actually worked really well in terms of actually uh, survival. So they suggest uh, risk factors uh, are tumor size and then histology, typical atypical, which is to have at least two of the three following. Uh, mitotic figures, uh, more than one per two uh, square millimeters, high nuclear grade and coagulative tumor necrosis. So that would give a point and then you give a score. So surprisingly, the plural involvement didn't actually uh, suggest a worse outcome like the previous paper that I showed you. So it seems like this score actually worked pretty well in the, um, in the early phases of the disease. Once you get plural involvement and multifocality, then that model most, most likely doesn't have any predictive value because the clinical actually overshadows the histologic predictive uh, parameters. But in the early stages of the disease, you can actually work uh, pretty well to stratify patients uh, and inform the clinicians which one may or may not uh, behave in a bad fashion. Epithelial hemangiogenic glioma, it's actually a tumor that we don't have treatment uh, and, and uh, people do it all over the place. They're not uh, uniform national, international protocols. So this was a, a huge uh, consensus conference that or, organized in December 2020 uh, organized by the European Society of Medical Oncology and involving more than 80 experts from Asia, Europe, and uh, North America. And they actually came up with their, some uh, consensus uh, guidelines uh, for, and it's actually a good paper to read uh, to get you up to date about what is the, uh, what, what is the current knowledge about uh, diagnosis, prognosis, uh, treatment um, of these uh, patients with this uh, rare disease. Nerve seed tumors, cutaneous malignant peripheral nerve seed tumors. Now, MPNSDs can happen in the skin, and uh, you know that MPNSDs are um, subdivided in conventional spindle and epithelioid. And uh, in contrast to the uh, deep soft tissue and visceral counterparts, uh, they are rarely associated with NF1. Okay, but be aware that every time you want to make the diagnosis of a conventional superficial MPNSD, 99% of the cases you're going to be wrong because it's going to be melanoma. So it's, 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 they're rare, but this is not the case with the epithelioid MPNSD. And epithelioid MPNSDs, if you're gonna see an MPNSD, it's probably of epithelioid subtype because most commonly they happen on the dermal and subcutaneous, so superficially. And uh, that's how they look. They have this multi-lobulated uh, appearance with these epithelioid cells, but they look malignant, have a circular nuclear uh, chromatin pattern with uh, prominent nucleoli uh, and uh, they kind of look malignant. And if you go high power, you see multiple mitotic figures and uh, atypical mitotic figures as well. Now, there are diffusive positive for SR100, and they can be misdiagnosed for melanoma, <clears throat> but they're not positive for melanocytic markers. And the useful thing to do is like about two thirds of them are gonna be uh, loss for I9, for I9. Melanomas can have I9 mutations, <clears throat> but they're not gonna have, <clears throat> sorry, they're not gonna have a um, uh, ionized loss of protein. No, no melanoma has been described with ionized loss of protein expression. So that can be a useful marker in two thirds of the cases. One third of the cases you have retention of epithelial of ionized. So that is actually a histologic diagnosis and it can be misdiagnosed. This is a case that I had as a fellow <clears throat> that a patient has been misdiagnosed for um, a, a young patient, a metastatic stage four 
melanoma of a non-primary, where in fact was a, a case of epithelial malignant peripheral nerve syndrome. So this was the case. So every time you have this multilobulated appearance out of the blue, this multilobulated appearance, and the cells that look very uniform, it's malignant, but very uniform, you know, a melanoma of that size and metastatic, you wouldn't expect to be have that uniform cytology. And they are at the diffuse yes or positive, but negative for other melanocytic markers, which is another a caveat, you know, epithelioid, epi, and a melanoma, that epithelioid, you wouldn't expect to lose more specific melanocytic markers. Uh, the, the melanomas lose more specific melanocytic markers when they actually show uh, more spindle cell phenotype. And of course, it was INI loss. And every time you assess a stain for loss, you want to see that it has a good internal positive control. And that actually here is an inflammatory element. So that was actually a primary epithelial MPNSD, it's still a malignant tumor with an aggressive behavior, but not at stage four uh, metastatic epithelial melanoma from somewhere else. However, you have to be aware that one uh, differential diagnosis of epithelial MPNSD, it is epithelial schwannoma. And epithelial schwannomas, the great majority of them happen in the superficial uh, aspect of uh, uh, superficial locations. Here, here, the great majority. And this is a case of epithelial schwannoma has this, if you do AMA, you characterize this, uh, the perineural capsule. And the cells have this kind of epithelioid uh, gland, no significant uh, cytologic atypia, multilobulated. They can kind of be a little bit of mixoid in the background. And you can have kind of degenerative atypia, the same that you see in ancient schwannomas. But you can have a true epithelioid MPNSDs arising in the background of epithelioid schwannoma. But in, the atypia is true atypia. It's not this degenerative type. You see here the atypia here, uh, multiple mitotic figures with uh, true atypia, vesicular chromatin pattern, prominent nucleoli, uh, a tumor that looks atypical in the background. So in this case, uh, INI is not going to be very helpful because INI has been seen uh, to be lost in 40 to 50 percent of epithelial schwannomas as well. So INI is useful when you are definitely in the malignant category. So is it an epithelial MPNSD or is it a melanoma? So I and I can be helpful, but you, when you are between is an epithelial MPNSD versus epithelial schwannoma or an epithelial MPNSD arising in epithelial schwannoma, then I and I is not going to be helpful uh, and you have to rely on morphology. Of course, EMA per neurocaption, that may, that may actually a little bit helpful here, but you have to be aware of that I and I. Epithelial sarcoma is um, the last tumor that I'm going to talk about. Um, the distal type, the classic, has predominantly subcutaneous tissue of the distal extremities of young adults. And of course, you have the proximal type, which has a predilection for limb gird girdles and deep pelvic perineal soft tissue. And it has a significant morphologic overlap with pediatric malignant rhabdoid tumor. And sometimes the, the distinction is kind of arbitrary. And um, usually, clinically, the epithelial sarcoma, they look uh, ulcerated. They may have this kind of a sporotricoid. Uh, appearance. And uh, when you see something that is um, ulcerated, you always be aware, especially in the experiments in a young individual, be aware, could this be an epithelial sarcoma? And it can look very bland. It can resemble a, a granulomatous uh, a process, like a granulomanulara or a granulomatous dermatitis uh, with necrobiosis. But if you go high power, you actually, the cells, they look more atypical. They, 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 the atypia is significant. Uh, with hyperchromasia, but sometimes can look so bland, like this looks like a fibroblastic. So every time you have a fibroblastic neoplasm, you, especially if it's ulcerated and you don't know where to put it, think about epithelial sarcoma because you don't want to miss that diagnosis. A misdiagnosis is actually, it can be dreadful. Uh, and here is an epithelial sarcoma and the helpful stain is actually uh, shows INI loss in about 95% of the cases with nice internal positive control. Epithelial sarcoma is positive for EMA and keratin. And EMA is valuable because sometimes you have keratin poor cases. Uh, it's positive for CD34 and it's lost for a smart PA1, INI1, and 95%. And rarely you have loss of other uh, proteins of the SWI, SNF uh, complex like smart A4 and smart C12. You have to be aware that ERG, which we use it for endothelial differentiation, can be positive uh, depending on the clone um, uh, that you use. So if you use the uh, if you if you use the uh, C terminus clone, uh, 
it's actually can be uh, positive in a significant number of, of cases. Uh, sorry, the, the N-terminus clone, where if you use about 30%, but if you use the C-terminus clone, it's only positive in two, 3%. So that have to be aware of which clone do you use. Most likely you use the C-terminus. So you can imagine uh, that if the problem that can arise is because epithelial sarcoma can be positive for CD34, can be positive for ERK. It actually can be positive for FLY1 and D240. Uh, so if you don't think about it, you may actually go the route of an epithelioid and it can be positive for keratin. And we know that happened with epithelioid uh, vascular tumors and you can go down the route of an epithelioid vascular tumor. So definitely you have to do um, uh, CD31 because that it's going to be negative for epithelial uh, sarcoma and positive in epithelial vascular uh, tumors. Now, we know that there are other proteins in the SWI uh, SNF uh, complex uh, and 5% they show preservation of INI1 and may loss of SMARC A A A4, for example. And there are some preliminary data they suggest that may actually be a prognostic factor and may actually behave more aggressively presumably because the um, loss of the other proteins of this complex may exercise a stronger influence uh, on the dysfunction of this very uh, important complex in uh, human neoplasia. And I'm gonna close with a case I had, um, who shows another tumor can show epithelial uh, features. So a 58 year old male with a, had a history of growing dedifferentiated liposarcoma. Uh, were presented with multiple superficial papules at the, periphery, at the periphery of the skin flap. And that was the biopsy. You see these highly malignant uh, hyperchromatic cells with a nucleomegaly, vesicular chromatin pattern, prominent nucleoli, multiple mitosis, clearly malignant. And this tumor was negative for keratin, negative for S100, but it was diffusely positive for MDM2 and CDK4, because we know this patient had a, 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 a differentiated liposarcoma. And other, other uh, additional stains were negative. So the best diagnosis for here, it is a metastatic recurrent epithelial dedifferentiated liposarcoma. Uh, and this was the original, the deeper of uh, the uh, groin, which is just here, well differentiated liposarcoma and then dedifferentiated liposarcoma with epithelial features that were diffusely positive for MDM2 and CDK4. And you have to be aware of that dedifferentiated liposarcoma uh, has, can have epithelioid in uh, approximately 3%, really epithelioid, and actually can actually mimicking uh, other entities with carcinoma, melanoma, and mesothelioma. But actually can have epithelial features, like true epithelial transdifferentiation. So this is a, 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 a dedifferentiated liposarcoma with epithelioid uh, features, can have, can have kind of rhabdoid appearance. Here's an, in between um, um, uh, colon crypts here but sometimes can have epithelial differentiation, like diffusely strongly keratin positive uh, with uh, glands formation and actually it's a dedifferentiated liposarcoma, very, very rare, uh, something that you should be aware. Of. And of course it was a, an extraordinary case that we felt compelled to uh,